A series of lectures by Professor George Phillies, based on his book, Phenomenology of Polymer Solution Dynamics, Cambridge University Press, 2011. And stand by for our forthcoming lecture series, Statistical Mechanics, Introduction to Mechanics, Harmonic Oscillation, and Game Design based on Chapter 4, Quasi-Elastic Light Scattering and Diffusion. Why should we advance to consider scattering and diffusion? Of course, historically, the answer is that's where we started. The first useful experiments related to this book were done with probe diffusion. The analysis, though, proceeded to look at tracer diffusion, self-diffusion, viscosity, work that had been done long before, of course and then branched out in all sorts of directions. The prior lecture came to a number of conclusions on how polymers move in solution, but to those conclusions there are highly rational and acceptable objections. The first point is, you are looking at the motion of extremely large molecules, 140,000, 190,000 base pairs, huge molecules in terms of their size. As a result, the electrical force on a single molecule is extremely large. Furthermore, whatever is happening in terms of the diffusive motion of that huge molecule is very slow, so you're looking at something that is close to zero frequency. One might be concerned, this does not have to be the case, that those discussions of electrophoresis were in some sort of pseudo-linear regime applying to large molecules at somewhat higher fields and that if you'd truly gone to very low fields and very slow motions of the large molecules you would have seen something else. You could also worry, for example, that you were seeing stress or strain failure of a polymeric meshwork of some sort and that if you'd actually applied much weaker fields that is, gone to very low electrical fields, you'd have seen some other behavior. How do we get around that? We go to systems which in principle have to be linear. We go to look at diffusing systems. And to look at diffusion, we have to start by talking about light scattering. I began by discussing diffusion coefficients. There's a very extensive terminology for diffusion coefficients. The terminology is not all consistent. I use only a narrow section of it. We'll start by looking at the simplest diffusion experiment. We have on the left a concentrated solution of those green circles. We have on the right a considerably more dilute solution of the green circles. Uh, Fick's law tells us for a normal system we have diffusion down the concentration gradient. The solution relaxes. Corresponding to that, the small blue solvent molecules move in the direction opposite to the direction the large green circles are moving because the volume of the system somehow has to be conserved in some sense. We are looking at what I will term mutual diffusion as described by the mutual diffusion coefficient d sub m. There exists, however, a second complete class of experiments. In these experiments, we measure the motion of a single object through a polymeric matrix background. In this figure, the green circles represent the matrix background. We've tagged one of the green circles bright red, and we measure its motions, the red track, as it moves through the other green circles and the solvent. We call this experiment, where the tagged molecule is basically identical to the untagged molecules, a measurement of the self-diffusion coefficient, ds. Now we could also do a somewhat different experiment in which we drop into the system, the blue square, a polymer molecule that is a bit different, for example entirely different in size, than the polymer molecules that constitute the matrix. In that case we're studying the tracer diffusion coefficient, sometimes abbreviated d sub t. Finally, we could take the blue square and we could make it something very different than the polymeric matrix. We could make it a mesoscopic probe particle, say a polystyrene latex sphere. We could measure the motion of the 
sphere through a polymer solution matrix, and that's the study of probe diffusion as characterized by the probe diffusion coefficient d sub p. In addition to these terms that I've introduced and will use in later lectures, you sometimes run into other terms, for example, the interdiffusion coefficient. Those terms, and there are a whole bunch of them, I will not use. You should realize in particular that the interdiffusion coefficient sometimes means the mutual diffusion coefficient, sometimes means the self-diffusion coefficient, and you need to be alert to be sure what is meant when a particular author uses that term. So here we have a representative scattering, light scattering experiment. There is an incident light ray, the red arrow. It comes in, it strikes the scattering particles, those are the little red circles. Light is scattered in all directions, in particular it's scattered blue arrows towards the detector. Those crosshatch lines represent planes of constant phase depending on the relative position of the, in this case, just the two molecules, the phase of the light received at the detector from one molecule does not have to be the same as the phase of the light scattered from the other molecule, and in that case we can get interference. Furthermore, as the molecules move, the degree of interference changes, and the scattered light becomes brighter and dimmer. That's the physical basis of light scattering. What do we then do experimentally? Light scattering, the amount of scattered light, is related to the particle positions and motions. Experimentally, we start by determining something known as the intensity-intensity time correlation function. That's S of QT. What do we do? Well, we have the intensity of the scattered light, I. The intensity is different in different directions. Those directions are labeled by what is known as the scattering vector Q. And we cross multiply the intensities of pairs of times separated by a time T. We average over lots of pairs of intensities, each separated by a time T. We do all those cross products, add them up, and we get S of QT. S is in turn determined by what is known as the dynamic structure factor, G, G superscript 1. In particular, S of QT has a constant term, which simply sits there, and it has a time-dependent term multiplied by another constant, and that time-dependent term is determined by the square of G1, G superscript 1 being the dynamic structure factor. The dynamic structure factor, in turn, is determined by where the particles are, and that's the big equation at the center of the screen. What do we have as a determination of G sub 1? Well, we have actually a whole bunch of terms because the indices I and J label all the scattering particles in solution and separately go from 1 to N. I and J may be equal. B sub I and B sub J are scattering lengths. They determine how much light each particle scatters. Uh, they can be time dependent. That's how you do rotational diffusion measurements. But we then hit the large exponential factor e to the I Q dot the difference between the positions of two particles. Of course, I and J can be equal, in which case R sub I of T minus R sub, it's again I of zero, is how far that particle has moved during time T. Otherwise, you're looking at one particle at time zero and a different particle at time T. That factor, the complex exponential, arises from the phase of scattering by each particle. The wave vector Q is the difference between the final and incident wave vectors of the light coming into the system and going out of the system. Light scattering spectroscopy, as has been known for 40 years, I proved it in my doctoral work, measures the mutual diffusion coefficient and not the self-diffusion coefficient. In particular, then, G1 does not equal and you will see this in the literature on occasion, x minus q squared delta r squared, except in the very special case you have a very dilute solution and the mutual and self-diffusion coefficients are equal to each other. Well, dm and ds in general are not equal to each other, and g1 of qt does not equal x minus q squared delta r squared in general.
40 years after this was figured out, people are still getting it wrong. How can you tell if G1 equals that Q squared delta R squared term? Well, Dube's theorem solves that for you. If G1 is equal to that form, G1 is a pure exponential, a single exponential in time. Light scattering spectroscopy has an extremely large literature on experimental methods, cell design, correlator design, data analysis, and on and on and on. I'm going to emphasize in this verbal discussion only one important point, namely that the dynamic structure factor only reveals a few independent parameters. That's because the dynamic structure factor, at least approximately, can be represented as a summation of a modest number of exponentials. Uh, in going back from the dynamic structure factor to the time constants or amplitudes of the exponentials, you don't have to use exponentials, that's only an example, uh, is what is known as an ill-posed problem. The solutions are extremely sensitive to noise. How many parameters can you actually pull out of a light scattering spectrum? Well, the answer to some extent is it depends. How many channels does your correlator have? What's the signal to noise you're getting in your experiment? If there are multiple relaxations, say several exponentials or stretched exponentials or whatever, how far are they apart in time? With an old-fashioned, say, 128-channel linear correlator and signal-to-noise ratios you could practically get a few hundred or a thousand, you could pull out two parameters if you worked hard. I've done it. One of my students did it. If you have a modern logarithmic correlator, so you measure the whole relaxation function at the same time, and you get signal-to-noise ratios of a few thousand, you can do better. I'd better pause. What do I mean by signal-to-noise ratio? Well, I am using the legitimate definition used in all other parts of physics. Namely, you fit a smooth curve to the data, you measure data point minus smooth curve, mean square fit, take a square root, and you divide the noise into, say, the amplitude of the first channel. That's the true signal-to-noise ratio. Some people use signal-to-noise ratio with a completely different meaning, which is perfectly good, but it's not the definition of signal-to-noise that anyone else in physics uses. Suppose you have a modern correlator and a signal-to-noise ratio in the thousands. You can pull out four or five parameters or less. If you're really lucky and you have three relaxations whose shape you can approximate fairly accurately and they're separated spaced over five orders or six orders of magnitude and time, you can actually get out maybe eight parameters. Kirill Streletsky and I did this. Well, I really, the truth is, Kirill did it and I kibitzed on occasion, but he did all the hard and good work on it. And that's eight parameters at a maximum. And now we hit the brick wall. If you can characterize any light scattering spectrum by two or four or eight parameters, that's all the parameters there are. And if you have some other method that claims to measure, oh, 20 parameters, you should realize those parameters aren't really right because there's something called information theory that tells you there aren't that many parameters in the data. There are only two or four or maybe, if you're lucky, eight. Very important lesson on fitting light scattering spectra. I published a paper on it. You can find it in my Vita. And that's what I'm going to tell you about light scattering spectroscopy, perhaps more than you really wanted to know.